All right, today we're talking about teller dislocations. Uh, we just had one come in the other day that actually happened in her sleep. So that's a little rare. Uh, usually when a patella dislocation happens, we have contact, right? Or we have at least some sort of impact uh, if there's not contact. So it only happens in about five in every 100,000 people per year. So it's not a injury that happens a lot, but the, the people it does happen to, it tends to have a high recurrence rate. The reason being is there tends to be a structural component behind this. So 80% of people that will have a patella dislocation have what's called trochlear dysplasia. So that can be a combination of two things or one or the other. So you can have uh, the groove in the bottom of your femur. So if you look on what's called a sunrise view on an x-ray, um, the groove in your femur may be a little more shallow, which means that it, uh, if you look at your patella, it can just slide out the side. Or your patella itself, the facet on the bottom of the patella can be shallow, or you could have both. And it just makes it easier from a structural standpoint to slide out the side. Two other components that come into this are 80% of people are women. Now, I don't know what the crossover point is on trochlear dysplasia and women. And if it's, you know, if you have trochlear dysplasia and you're a woman, I'm not saying your kneecaps are going to fly out to the Southwest, but like they aren't going to have a great time if you're in, in particular, cutting sports, things with a lateral component to it, or a lot of impact deceleration, think a trail runner running downhill full speed. About 50% of people, this is men and women, have trochlear dysplasia, and that's from intrauterine ultrasound studies. So, uh, the last thing, if you're hypermobile, so a classic test for hypermobility is the baiting or biting, you know, pick your poison. Uh, criteria, it's nine tests, or nine little movements, each one gets a point. I have another video on that that I'll link to in here, you can go check out what the biting criteria looks like. But if you're above a six out of nine, you're getting into that hypermobile category. Again, it makes sense that the tissues around your knee, the retinaculum, the patellar tendon, all those things are gonna have a harder time hanging onto your kneecap, in particular with rotation and side to side movement. So what can get injured when your patella dislocates? Well, one of the first things that uh, we're always concerned about or looking for in particular in children is did the, the MPFL, the medial patellofemoral ligament get damaged? That's, if you can imagine on the inside of your knee, when the kneecap goes to the side, there's a high likelihood that you get a partial rupture, just like an ankle sprain. Um, sometimes you get a full rupture, in particular with repeated bouts of dislocation. The other thing it, we gotta look for or rule out sometimes is fracture. So you can have a trochlear fracture. Remember we talked about the trochlear groove. You can kind of bump into the side of that. If it's traumatic, you can also do a little chip fracture of that. You can also uh, fracture the bottom of the patella. The other thing on the bottom of the patella that can get damaged very easily here is the subpatellar cartilage. So if you have had you know, some degenerative change in your knee, you're up there in age, you're probably suffering from chondromalacia patella. That just means softening of the cartilage on the underside of the knee. Well, you can also have irritation of that cartilage just from uh, banging it and kind of uh, scraping it as it goes over the side of that uh, femur. Uh, of course, it makes sense that the soft tissue around the front of the knee, like your patellar tendon, the retinaculum, think saran wrap that goes around your knee to kind of hold things together. Those things, in particular, with repeated bouts, can get uh, a little bit beat up and you can have you know, retinacular tears or acute tendinopathy to the point of sometimes a, a tendon rupture in a very severe case of patellar dislocation or the patellar dislocation or patellar tendon rupture leads to a patellar dislocation as well. Um, so those would be the associated injuries. So what do we do with these? Well, the first thing we gotta do is protect, right? Uh, depending on the severity of the trauma, mechanisms of injury, uh, how many times have they done it, you know, the appropriate imaging is usually MRI, not necessarily an X-ray. An X-ray can actually be beneficial for looking at the structure a little bit better than an MRI from the trochlear groove, dysplasia, the facets on the patella. Uh, but an MRI is obviously gonna show us soft tissue damage uh, and as best we can, you know, rule in or out, is there a high likelihood for further injury or is this a surgical case? Um, beyond the protection phase though, we always wanna think first motor control. So what's that mean? Just think how you move. So if I go to put the brakes on in single leg stance and I have this high propensity for this valgus collapse, we're not demonizing the valgus collapse, but just think relative motion. As your femur and tibia go in and your patella wants to maybe get uh, pulled out by some of the musculature on the lateral side, there's a mismatch of forces happening there and there's a higher likelihood of injury. So once we've kind of worked on motor control, and that's not just controlling com coronal plane movement, it's how your foot and your hip interact together, we would want to then say, maybe we go to, in particular, motor control deceleration. I've mentioned it a couple times. Can I put the brakes on in the sagittal plane? Can I jump down from a box? Can I put the brakes on in the coronal plane as I advance? 
Um, we want to know if you can decelerate way before we want to know if you can generate force because that's where most of these injuries happen, whether that's a muscle strain or dislocation or ligament uh, strain sprain. Last thing would be uh, capacitizing the tissues, right? Whether that's the patellar tendon, um, you know, the MPFL, the ligamentous structures. Capacity just comes down to what? We have to get those tissues A to heal. We know that the best way to get things to heal is to uh, apply movement early and often for all sorts of reasons. Uh, driving a, a neurochemical change there, increasing vascularity, reducing pain and inflammation. Um, and then we get to what? Strength training. We want to strength train the improved motor control and then the tissues that may have been injured and then we're building capacity with improved motor control and that's just the name of the game for any injury, including a patellar dislocation. So I think that's about all I got to say on patellar dislocation. There's a ton of information out there, but hopefully that helps you a little bit.